we are here, like right when this is really starting. I don't see how we don't make it through the 2030s without a Bitcoin standard. The internet without Bitcoin is actually going to centralize and move into a direction that makes the internet a negative in a lot of different ways. The interest rate price controls and the fiat system don't work if people have an escape. Bitcoin is small enough that it like moves like crazy and dollar is so huge that it's just like really hard to see anything. But as they get closer and you start to see little movements, you just shift. Eventually, one's only going down and one's only going up on a long enough timeline. In seven years, it'll be a very, very interesting conversation. Seven years, we may be looking back and thinking like, oh yeah, this is, we're already, we're already past that point where that market can't operate as if Bitcoin doesn't exist. I want to start the day with what do you think is the most widely misunderstood aspect in Bitcoin when you talk on the one hand with Bitcoiners, but also on the other hand with uh, normies that are not in Bitcoin. And what should like what should be the topic that I should f uh, feature in almost every podcast episode to educate people on? Oh, so the biggest disconnect without question, and it's funny because like I've been wasting time on X this on Twitter this morning, and uh, um, and it's it's the, with the finance guy or whatever who's having the exact same. The, the, the mental frame, the, the picture that he has for what Bitcoin is, is just so, it's so payments app. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's just like, this is, it's a, it's a monetary asset. And I actually got him to recognize that most people still don't trust Bitcoin, don't understand what it is, and have no conception that it's like a reliable place to store value. And I'm like, yes, 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 trust, trust. <laughs> Trust, the trust market, the cycle of adoption of, of trust as a monetary good is still incredibly nascent. And, you know, when when you look at monetary history and you're trying to compare it to stuff like he's comparing it to, which this is an analogy that I this is an analogy that I use quite a bit is TCP IP because it is also a protocol and protocols have their own difficulties in network adoption, but it's a protocol and the money. And from the context of a money, he's thinking of it like a payments app. It's like, oh, well, Cash App was popular after like three years, you know? Why can't I use it at Costco? And I'm like, every other monetary, a good, a good in the market, a new monetary good that has been monetized. Literally, it's like an average of a century. Like, Bitcoin is being monetized faster than any other monetary good. The trust network is growing and providing a positive feedback for Bitcoin faster than any other money in history. It is succeeding wildly. And his like, I can't use it at Costco yet, and it's been 15 years, is like, I get that you see apps. You see apps, you see the internet, you see these technological things that have been adopted. You've never seen a trust network be adopted. You've never seen an asset be monetized from zero because if you, and, and, and I'm trying right now, actually, the last, the last thing I said to him was, what's the most recent thing that you can think of that was a good, that was monetized? What's the most recent one? What was it like? How long did it take? Like, what were the characteristics? Um, and, and that's like a huge disconnect. All the, all the normies that I talk to, They, they think in apps, they think in websites, they think in platforms. It's just like they don't realize that there's genuinely nothing, nothing in their span of 20 years of existence or 30 years, whatever it is, that actually relates to Bitcoin. They can really apply it to. You can get a general understanding of how, difficulty the, net, how difficult the network effect and how the technology stack is going to unfold. Because you can look at Bitcoin like a protocol and we have the internet to compare it to. It, Bitcoin is a fundamental protocol as, as core to our communication layers. In fact, arguably below it, even though it, you kind of need the internet for Bitcoin to work, you technically don't. Like it's the, the trust layer actually becomes this weird because the, you know, the internet layer is right here. You've got like the foundation of society. You've got like culture, language. Poly like like uh, the societal rules and property rights and the political system. And then you've got communication layers, right? You, you, obviously, you can't have a communication layer until you have language. Um, so communication layers are, are above it. And then because of this communication layer, we are able to create a new monetary protocol, except that that new monetary protocol is actually down here. 
It's just, it can only exist because of the technology of the communication layer. Um, so it's, it's interesting to think about it that we're building a lower layer on with all of the tools of a higher layer. Uh, uh, and, but like that, that framing, so we can kind of understand the evolution of the technology stack because it is a protocol and we've, we've actually have a, a very prime and recent example of watching a protocol stack come into being, which most people still don't know much concrete shit about the history of the internet. They just kind of Google it. Like, um, but there's a fascinating and kind of rich history un un to unpack there, which I've done in a bunch of different episodes on the show. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's that Bitcoin's first network effect and adoption cycle is going to be very long. It's going to be very slow. And it's about trust. It is about yeah. trust. It's not about payments. It's not about buying stuff with it at Costco. It's about establishing its trust in the face of, you know, 200 some odd monetary competitors uh, and who also maintain a violent monopoly over the money market. Can it continue to exist and can it continue to be a money in those markets despite a violent monopoly preventing it? That's what Bitcoin's job is right now. So that's amazing. And I think um, the comparison with this TCP IP protocol is so crucial because people don't get that. Uh, they are always trying to compare MasterCard, PayPal and everything with Bitcoin, but these are layer yeah. three, four, five technology and not layer one technology. And yeah. once you study and I study uh, IT and, and computer science in, in school, like when I, started, I was like 15, 16 years old uh, from that onwards moment. And I know the TCPI pro protocols and still it was for me as a big hurdle to go over through that. Um, but for me, it's like with, with Bitcoin, you have the possibility to invest in the TCPI pro P protocol. This is something mind blowing. Like imagine yeah. like don't, don't having to care what application on there will succeed because with TCPIP you, you had to like, oh, will Facebook succeed? Will MySpace succeed? Will Amazon succeed? And you had to invest in there to gain from that. With Bitcoin, you can invest in the base layer, like in the TCPIP tokens, if you <laughs> want to do that, uh, which which also leads me kind of to the, to the next topic. Uh, do you think, uh, and we talked about a little bit, do you think the internet or Bitcoin is then the bigger revolution? Because we could argue that Bitcoin is kind of in the internet revolution and is the monetary aspect of the internet, but it's also its own thing where you can build on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because Bitcoin as a protocol technically can work on pen and paper. Um, it could actually be, it certainly wouldn't be very efficient. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it wouldn't provide like its security mechanism would be very difficult because you need a kind of broadcast layer for the protocol to actually work. But it could be done. Uh, you could in a really funny way, you could do it in a very slow, high settlement system over snail mail. You could do it over radio. So it's not technically necessary that you need the Internet for it. But it's never really going to operate without the internet because of the complexity of the design. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not practical without the internet is probably the better way to put it. Uh, so from the context of which is the more revolutionary uh, invention, so to speak, is it's a question of, which one will have the most impact versus which one is interdependent on the other. Like they, they are interdependent on each other. Like the internet without Bitcoin is actually going to centralize and move into a direction that makes the internet uh, a negative in a lot of different ways. And Bitcoin without the internet can't quite, can't really work. They, they, the internet is kind of the establishment of the ecosystem and the Bitcoin is, uh, and Bitcoin is the protocol that will create the rules and the incentives for that ecosystem. So the ecosystem alone is going would lead to these giant centralized platforms and all of these things without a monetary a base monetary protocol in it. Um, which which is why the internet was such a profound 
invention from the context of communication and de opening the communication layers of the world. Uh, but then Bitcoin, I think, is actually going to reinvent the Internet. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin is at a lower level from a from a fundamental conse a consequential layer in society. It, it establishes rules, uh, the limits of political control. It establishes the cost and ability to exit abusive and violent monopolies and jurisdictions and all of these things. And, uh, you know, if you read like something like uh, Nick Zabo has a great piece on this called Exit and Freedom, is that largely the, the very means by which freedom is established has nothing to do with getting a political system that is nice or is like really good. It's about lowering the barrier to exit. Because if you can exit your value from an intrusive political system uh, or a, an abusive or tyrannical uh, political system, well, then you can defund that political system very quickly because the whole basis of it is to steal value that you didn't, that, that it doesn't have, uh, that it didn't earn or it doesn't create. Um, uh, you know, if you read something like uh, 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 The Sovereign Individual, um, uh, I think they have a brilliant thesis that the, the better way to understand history is through a technological lens on the economics of violence is what does it cost to steal something from someone and uh what is the what's the degree of the feedback mechanism this is why the most important things in his in history for establishing the way society works today have been agriculture gunpowder printing press internet like all of these things um and uh like for instance the state didn't exist before agriculture it's very, if you think about it through the context of the economics of violence, there's a very simple reason why. is because if we're hunter gatherers and we just carry all our value on our back, and you know, there's it's just like kind of free flowing society, you can move from one area to another. No mafia can, like, you're not going to stay a slave. You're not going to, you're not going to be, you know, beholden to some sort of mafia that takes half of what you earn and half of what you value. You're just going to throw it all on your back and you're going to leave. So the economics of violence, the ability to exit because you can carry all of your value with you is very, very low. And thus there is essentially freedom because abuse can't, does not have this positive, or I guess technically this negative feedback loop where the stronger they get, the easier it is for, their, for them to enforce their control and authority. Whereas when agriculture comes along, now 98% of our value is trapped. Stuck right there on the land. I've built a house. I have oxen. I have a harvest that's not even going to come until next year. I, I have to be here. If I, if I pick up and leave, my cost of exit is now 98% of my value. So when the mafia comes with sticks and, you know, they put a knife to my wife's throat and they say, you're going to give me half of what you earn, that's the lower cost. I give them half of what I earn because otherwise I lose 98% to leave with my family. Now, sometimes the cost does get that high. Sometimes you don't want to live as a slave and sometimes you do leave, but you leave 98% of your value for the mafia. So they don't care. And uh, so in thinking about the rules, how, how this economics of violence establishes uh, the limitations of tyranny in a society, Bitcoin literally shifts the entire dynamic practically back to the hunter gatherer days. Now I can just, I can sell into that system. I can, I can sell into that market for an asset that I can hold in my mind. I can, I can have it in my brain and I can walk to any other jurisdiction. I can leave to anywhere in the world. And the cost of exit has dressed, drastically, drastically plummeted um, because we have a, essentially a system of property rights without a state. We have a system of holding and exchanging value without the need for any sort of state enforcement. And in fact, that works in spite of state enforcement, in spite of tyrannical controls, capital controls, and all of these things. Um, and, and I think the people who, I think, don't understand the degree of effect the economics of violence has in the structure of the world today 
it's very easy for them to misplace or, or miscalculate how unbelievably profound the effect of making not even a significant shift, a small shift in the economics of violence changes the world. Bitcoin is a big shift in the economics of violence. Comparably, like we don't really have a lot of good examples, I think, on something that has changed it so drastically in such a short period of time. Um, and it, it will continue to take time to realize this in practice. Uh, but shit. Um, I, I think it, it very much depends on how you treat the interdependent relationship. But I think Bitcoin is by far the more fundamental protocol and it changes. It has a more fundamental change to how we will design or how we will organize as a species. That's, uh, that's an, just an amazing speech that you just gave. Wow. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and I think uh, technology in itself is so interesting. And I mentioned before the, the, the podcast also you did with um, sure. uh, Preston uh, about AI. And mm -hmm. I think a lot about how AI will play a bigger and bigger role because I use it myself more and more. And uh, I see it every day how it gets more intelligent how it gets better and better integrated and how it grasps more and more data from from all over uh and you gave so many great examples in the podcast um do you see um like first of all before we go to the dangers of of ai um what what role do you think or will ai play a role uh in the bitcoin adoption and and uh, obvious question also to ask will ai choose Bitcoin as, as a, the, the main store of value? Um, uh, 100%. Um, I honestly think AI will largely... It, you won't be able to disconnect AI from pretty much anything. Um, AI is... In fact, this is like... God, gee, one of the craziest things to think about like where we are today is how many... You, you know, the overwhelming amount of innovation and like new technology that you have in a world or, or, or in, in a market over time, the overwhelming majority is kind of, uh, I forget there's like a specific term for it. It's like maintaining technology. Um, uh, it's, it's innovation that occurs within the systems that we have. Like, like rather than changing the piston, uh, the piston, uh, you know, uh, uh, intake exhaust, uh, uh, Oh, Jesus Christ. What's the word? Whatever. The piston engine, the internal combustion engine, rather than changing the fundamental design of the internal combustion engine, I'm missing, I'm brain farting on one piece of it. Um, <laughs> uh, you make the gears a little bit stronger or you space them out in a new way to get it slightly more efficient or you, you know, put in a turbo on the intake so you can put in more pressure or you do electronic valves instead of... Um, Uh, instead of a manual valve, uh, and you can, you know, you can micro control the amount of release or like input on the pressure and you can get more efficient with a computer. Like you, you change little things around the design, but you, uh, uh, but you don't change the system. One of the fascinating things about where we are today is how many systems disruptions we are witnessing at the same time. AI is one of those things. Uh, AI is kind of like a way to model a series or a set of patterns um, at a large scale. I, I like to think about it as, uh, I think this is a, a decent analogy, at least a picture. It's not totally accurate, but I've actually, since, since I thought about this from uh, one of the pieces that broke down uh, that I covered on the show on AI Unchained, um, uh, for how an LLM works and how the encoding, decoding and all of this stuff works is it immediately painted a picture in my mind of like, this is actually a giant compression algorithm for relationships between words, for, for patterns in language. And so that you could think of it as an insanely lossy compression so that I, I can compress a bunch of articles or a bunch of pictures or, or something and rather than storing the, the actual image data, 
And rather than storing all the individual pixels, which I could do before and I can do on a hard drive, but that takes up an enormous amount of space. Instead, what I've done is I have compressed the relationship between these pixels over here and these pixels over here and connected them to, connected them to the idea of a cat. And so later on, I am able to, quote unquote, redraw a cat. I'm able to exchange the specificity of the data for computation. And I am able to compute back out of it the pattern of a cat even though it's not actually a picture of any one particular cat. But there is always some set of relationships between the pixels that a cat basically represents. Our eyes see it, our minds see it all the time, right? I can see that there is a pattern that makes a cat. And if it looks more like a dog, well, I'm, I recognize that there's a dog. The brain is a model creation tool. And that's a lot of re uh, reason that I think uh, people have uh, misunderstandings about where AI is. AI, all of these different AIs are explicit models about explicit sets of patterns, while the human brain is a generalized model creation tool. We create new models about all sorts of things all the time. We're a giant, like, broad, generalized, multimodality model creation tool. So we're more like the computer, the PyTorch, um, and the, the software set and the model because we have thousands of models about all sorts of different things. You know, I have, I have models about how maps work. I have models about physical location. You developed, you, you developed thousands of models about reality before you even can speak. You know, language isn't the entirety of how we relate to the world. Like, I already know not to go jump off a cliff before I'm making full sentences, you know, because I fell down and I hurt myself and I bumped my knee. Uh, so, like, I have many models of reality. Um, and... Uh, AI is, is going to be one of the most efficient and adaptive ways at which we've ever stored and recalled patterns. Um, like we're going to be able to it, basically anything. It's kind of like the assembly line, you know, allowed us to take the um, meticulous process of you know, handcrafting all of these things and kind of automated it by recognizing the pattern in that in the series of events and then, you know, creating some concrete thing at each piece that stamped out ubiquitous um, or, or, you know, equal pieces at each at each stage of it. And so now, like, only one piece needs to actually be done. Well, this is kind of like that same sort of abstraction for tasks for patterns in language, for uh, for image generation and video generation patterns. Uh, and because of that, we basically are yet another step removed from the creation process. And now we're going to organize and understand the relationships between patterns. That's where we're going to be useful because, again, we're a big general multimodality model creation tool. So we're now going to use all of these individual models, just like I use my model of physics and my model of you know light and like all of those different things all the models that i have in my relationship with the world i use a combination of hundreds of these models to go build a tool uh, you know build some sort of a project or put my miner up in my my attic I'm, I'm constantly referring to tons of different models in my mind but the combination of all those all those things lets me accomplish a task well we're going to be doing the same thing with ai ai is going to be kind of an interaction layer um, like already, this is why I started the the um, series called uh, Devs Who Can't Code. And AI is going to be fascinatingly good at writing code uh, because code is a code is a language. And specifically, it is a language without ambiguity. So while it's actually going to be a little bit difficult at poetry or metaphors or analogies because it's really abstract, language is an ex extremely artistic uh, form of communication. People don't really appreciate that. Um, uh, and so language is actually, it's going to sound like a term paper every time it writes. And if you, if you, you know, give it something and you ask it to write you something, it's almost always going to be on the nose. One of the things that I do with my... Um, a couple AI tools that I use regularly for the podcast is I have uh, 
a little script that I built with ChatGPT. So, so I have a little app that I've built. Um, and, uh, uh, what it does is when I'm done with any sort of a show, like if I was, you know, we're recording this is as soon as I was done, I, I would export the video file and then I drop that on my transcribe app and it's going to write, it's going to print out an entire text file with the entire conversation. And then I take that text file and I put it into an LLM and I say, can you write me a short description? Can you frame it as a question uh, that will, you know, lead the the audience's mind toward the content of the show. And I've never actually used exactly what it gave me, but it always has a really good starting point because it will read the context and it will understand what the conversation was about, but it almost always asks an on the nose question. So like, uh, uh, and uh, whereas typically I want to ask one step removed. So like a, a good one was, um, uh, what was the episode about? Um, uh, why there was so much antagonism, like the bitter, bitter antagonism toward Bitcoin from policymakers. Like, why does Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren like literally like hate it? Like, why does she hate it? Why does Gary Gensler just like have to like have to make sure that Bitcoin ETFs don't get approved? And it basically wouldn't have happened without a uh, without the court forcing their hand. Well, it's because Bitcoin allows pure price signals. And the reason the fiat system works, the reason interest rate price controls work is because there's no exit valve. There's not an escape. You know, um, uh, Christine Lagarde said this explicitly and Alan Greenspan wrote about it in a paper um, uh, back in the 60s or 70s or something. Um, he talked about like the, the reason statists have such a profound antagonism, like a hysterical antagonism toward the gold standard and they come up as much propaganda against it as possible is specifically because the the interest rate price controls and the fiat system don't work if people have an escape. It becomes the alternative price signal that is essentially the canary in the coal mine for the financial system. So that's why they had to put a cap on it. They they had to outlaw ownership, you know, individual ownership of gold. Um uh, they had to suppress the ETFs. And luckily, gold is, well, luckily for them, unluckily for us, gold is such an insanely slow and impossible at scale to settle. Um, like you can't, you just can't settle $100 billion of gold, right? Like France couldn't even do it when they tried. They tried once over the period of 40 years, and the U.S. said no, you know, back in the, back in the 70s. So the ability to at scale force their hand on, on kind of revealing the true price. It's just not possible. Bitcoin can move a hundred billion dollars in a second for a, for two bucks transaction fee. Bitcoin can at scale move volume of value like nothing ever in history. And it can do it to any corner of the world instantly. And that's one thing that people don't realize is that even when transaction fees are a thousand dollars, it's still going to cause like on the base layer, it is still going to be such an astronomical price signal. Like you'll be able to move a trillion dollars out of a country in 10 minutes. Like you're talking about killing the, the survival of a country, the capital in a country being able to move intraday, intraday. Like that's insane to think about. And even better is the more capital is moving, cheaper it is to do. Like what's it? It was like a point zero 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 one percent fee at a thousand dollar transaction fee to move a trillion bucks, you know. Um, so, uh, at scale, Bitcoin becomes especially if it's available to retail, especially if it has broad global multi layered networks. You have the Lightning Network, you have retail in the ETFs, um, you have normal day to day users, you have countries like El Salvador adopting it. It becomes this alarm bell for every single time a bad policy decision is made. And as Christine Lagarde said, that our policies, their, their NERP policies, their, you know, negative interest rates, their, their attempts to control and choke the, uh, the debt markets of the world, capital controls only work, price controls only work if you control the entire market. If you have 20% of the market that you can't touch, that 20% is going to reveal instantaneously how stupid your policy is and all of your prices are false. 
Black market's going to have 300% of the price that your little price controls are. And black market is the only place that people are going to be able to get those products or services or whatever it is that you're trying to price control. Price controls don't work unless you have a totality over the market. The antagonism toward Bitcoin is specifically because it is an escape valve. As Christine Lagarde says, if there is an escape, people will use it and it won't work. Therefore, they cannot allow an escape. That is where that hyster hysterical antagonism comes from. That was a really, really long tangent to say, going back to the AI thing, is that it, it's when I, ask, when I get it to ask a question about that, it doesn't give me a question that leads to it. It gives me a question that's like super on the nose. Like, is, is uh, you know, Bitcoin a, an alarm bell for a financial policy? And, you know, is it a canary in the coal mine for the financial? Like it uses like something sp explicit from the conversation. And then it just gives a bunch of details rather than, you know, what's the, what's the source of this deep antagonism to Bitcoin from policymakers? Does it, does it shake the foundations of what they are able to accomplish and how? You know, that's, that's the more, that's the removed question that I would be going for. Um, but uh, anyway, holy crap, that was, a, that was a long tangent for just kind of saying that uh, I think AI is going to be our interface for accomplishing things. Um, uh, much like uh, we now think of the keyboard and the mouse as this is how we interact with computers. This is how we... You know, you can say that Photoshop killed art, but did it? Of course not. You just have Photoshop art. You know, you still draw on Photoshop. What we're looking at is the base layer of these tools, and it's a new layer. It's a new interface. It's far more akin to touch interface. It's far more akin to the um, the keyboard and mouse, I think, than it is, um, you know, a production like a like a film editing software or something like that like you'll still use it within film editing i guess is probably the way to think about it um but uh, uh like a decent example is uh, my brother was trying to make a, a funny meme the other day and and he asked me for my help because i i know how to use all these tools and he was just trying to use the stable cascade demo and it wasn't working uh and we ended up doing like 20 different things and like trying a bunch of stuff and we just could not get the picture to look like he described it you know, it was just a, a stupid meme. And, uh, and he ended up going back with like the very original meme and just putting like basic text over it. But uh, it's a good example of like, you can't just go say like, generate this image that I have in my head and then it just pops out. Like it's very explicit tools for very, for very concrete sorts of patterns. And if you don't know how to composite, you know, if you don't, if you don't know how to like, blend if you don't have a vision in your mind well then you're just going to kind of create the generic image diffusion that the image generator is going to create um and people are going to get bored with that shit fa they already have they already have uh like ai image generation like the stock image generation is already just kind of like scroll past it you know like it's not it, it doesn't pull the um interest that it once did because it's already kind of flooded all over the place um but yeah, anyway, that's the, the way I think about it is that AI is going to be a t an interaction layer. It's going to be a UI for how we do things, um, especially, especially write code. Um, uh, I mean, I've, I've just been building constantly, like just these little projects. Whenever I have the time to just sit down and, you know, throw 40 minutes an hour at a project, um, I can just make all sorts of little micro apps and it's getting increasingly complex like what you can do with it which is really exciting um and uh uh and more importantly going back to the other part of your question about bitcoin is i think one of the things about ai is that like i said in the compression analogy is that you're trading computation for data you're, you're storing the pattern of a thing at like, you know, 1% of storing the actual thing. And you can't fully take that same exact picture back out of it, but you can restore the pattern of the astronaut or the cat. <laughs> and because of that, there's an enormous amount of computation involved. And computation you can think of as a proof of work. It is a irreversible final payment. 
And when you have that computation as the basis for your interaction, imagine if it cost you a penny every time you moved the mouse. Like, it would be insanely difficult to price and deal with the cost of, you know, letting somebody use your API to a website if you were just pulling in a penny, 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 like just all over the place, every single time somebody does any interaction, it's costing you a penny because you just have an enormous amount of computation with every single thing that's occurring. Well, with AI, you re you literally have this. They're all they're running into bottlenecks everywhere because this is the it's exploding so fast in fact i read an article the other day and i'm uh, this is something that i've been trying to dig into a little bit more but it, it's it's very possible that we may have a resurgence of uh, nuclear power support and proponents because google apple nvidia and all of these companies are running out of power like they're using so much computation that they're desperate for a ro like a huge dense energy source and so they're like well we've got nuclear they, they don't they don't care they don't care about the politics anymore they care about a solution and there's not a direct solution so they're actually looking at kind of rebuilding this support for nuclear which is great because nuclear should have been the thing we should have been going through thorium reactors this whole time it would have solved a whole lot of shit if the government had had gone the thorium route rather than the uranium route but the governments wanted bombs they didn't want energy so uh we went uranium and plutonium uh but uh uh so it will be fascinating to watch that resurgence occur just because the demand of energy now outpaces what we can actually produce because of the staggering amount of computation but when you have an irreversible proof of work as a service well how do you accept payment on a non-settling, credit-based, identity-based payment system that can be, that, you know, is, has billions of dollars of fraud growing every year. Like, it gets worse and worse because the ability to mimic other people and the ability to steal their, the ease and low cost of stealing their information. Like, you can get a credit card, um, credit card details, social security, uh, address and everything for a, a person. I think it's like five dollars a pop typically on the dark web. You can just eviscerate somebody's life. It's so prevalent, like it's so out there that basically all of our information is exposed. It's simply that there's not enough people. You can't exploit it at scale. So literally, the only reason we don't all get hit with identity theft every single day is just because there's not enough thieves. Like that, that's literally the problem. You can't scale the theft fast enough. Um, <laughs> but the interesting thing about AI is that that is going to scale. You know, when I can have a picture of somebody and then I can do a video, like I just did this on my computer the other day. I turned my face into Selma Hayek live on my computer with, uh, I think I was using face fusion or was I using anim animated? No, no, yeah, it was, it was, it was face fusion. So like I have like a ton of AI software that I play around with all the time. Now, it did not look good at all because my beard, the bottom of my beard was still there. So it was a very, very creepy Selma Hayek. Um, but, uh, but it was really funny. I was showing it to my wife. She was like, don't ever show me that again. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Why have you done this? Um, and, uh, and I just thought it was hilarious. But uh, like, I was live. I was live doing that. I was live doing that on my MacBook. And it's not even optimized for M1. So I was basically using CPU level. And if I wanted to do it on my Linux machine, it'd be easy as cake because I've designed this thing to have, you know, I've got two beastly GPUs in this and 192 gigs of RAM. So I can do live change my face. Now, what does that mean if I can easily get an ID or I can use, there's a, oh, there's a model now that makes a can't really tell it's fake ID. And it's a just small model too because it's just trained on like driver's licenses. Um, and I can just generate an ID with whatever details that I want. And it's like almost indistinguishable as like a picture. How many things do you require as like proof of identity? Your KYC that is take a picture of your ID and take, take a selfie. I can do both of those on this computer easy with anybody that I want. I guess I might have to shave my beard if I wanted to be Selma Hayek. But um, uh, 
what happens to credit card fraud when you cannot prove who someone is digitally anymore? You need a different system. You need a different system of identity. Um, and that problem is just going to get worse every single year. I was actually just talking about it with my wife uh, yesterday because she was having like a big payment problem. We were just trying to get a stroller. I mean, excuse me, a uh, new car seat for Rad because he's outgrown his other one. And uh, it's not even like super expensive. It's like $280 or something like that. So it's not like like we're spending $10,000 and the bank's going to freak out and be like, what did you did you make this payment? Um, and like, there's like some sort of a problem. We have to contact the the company and like confirm something on the PNC. So it's just like, it's just like a nightmare. And I was like, I bet they're getting slammed with fraud right now. Like all of those numbers are up and AI is only making this easier in a long enough time scale when you can, you know, hit an API that pulls $20,000 worth of computation cost overnight. And you have, you have an irreversible service. Like they can't get that back. Like they can't, they can't like call up the energy company and be like, um, it was okay. It was a fraudulent customer. So we're just going to like not pay for that energy today. Um, and, uh, uh, so you have an irreversible proof of work service and then you also have exploding and easy to do fraud. I think that's just, this just keeps getting worse and worse until people realize you have to use an irreversible payment system. You have to use something that settles immediately to pay for a service that settles immediately. Um, and I mean, I don't think it will be super quick because you still have to build trust in the Bitcoin network. And like I said, the trust cycle is slow, uh, but I think it will speed it up because it will be, there will be a degree of necessity. Um, like if you have, you know, 90% of your market is in fiat credit card payments, but there's 20% of that, of that profit, uh, now is lost to fraud, to chargebacks. Uh, to all sorts of problems. And now you have 10% that's done in, you know, lightning and Bitcoin, but you have zero fraud because the payment is the payment. You know, at what point does the feedback loop start to benefit? Well, if I can get 1% more of Bitcoin and lightning service and take 1% away, well, that means I've got, uh, I've got like 0.2% less in fraud. You know, like, like you can start doing the math on, as we shift over and, you know, once that gets to like 30, 40 percent, you're like, this is looking increasingly stupid that we like we should just push all towards this direction. And like I said, long timeline, but I think it's kind of inevitable that you you have to have some sort of strong settlement system and key based ID in the world that we're heading into. I, I don't I, at least I don't see a different solution um, and I'm, I'm looking for one. Maybe maybe there is like we're super creative humans are really creative people we're built everybody's building shit like crazy maybe ai comes up with a solution i don't know 21 bitcoin is bitcoin only from day one and they teach and preach self-custody this is my go-to exchange when someone asks me oh where can i buy my bitcoin from this is the easiest entry for bitcoiners and if you want lower fees plus at the same time support this podcast use code robin and click the link in the description i totally agree with that uh, that uh, bitcoin is actually for that probably also the fix and um there's like probably 50 questions I want to ask you just from the last 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 it's hard. Sorry, I, <laughs> I, I ramble, I ramble, I have I context and I just, I just go for it. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. I love it a lot. Uh, and, uh, the, the main thing, I think we, we can now focus on, uh, the, the, the second part or like the, the, the later part now of the podcast. Um, well, we have all these factors that contribute to the Bitcoin adoption and we have uh, AI also and AI is enhancing that, uh, I think, also like that. Uh, and there is uh, more and more trust in Bitcoin and less and less trust in fiat. Fiat is starting to collapse more and more, just like the last 50 years has shown and the next 50 years, I think, will not be different from that. Um, what will happen on, uh, to a society which is completely on a Bitcoin standard with all the implications, uh, you just mentioned with trust gaining back. Uh, I had one of my first podcasts that I ever had on was, um, uh, a, a guy who said Bitcoin is a system based of love because you can 
actually trust the thing again and trust is uh, deeply connected with love uh so what what do you think will happen when when we have this complete sound money standard and we have this uh, utopia of only bitcoin uh do you actually like first of all do you think this will happen in like the next hundred years in our lifetime or does it take um, more than that because the trust is slower to, to gain and what will then a uh, society on that look like or does it look different even so like i said trust takes it's a it's a very slow network effect um and it's a very hard one network effect um because you know trust is lost quickly built very very slowly um And I think, honestly, our move to a Bitcoin world is 10 to 15 years. Um, like, I really like Alex Fetsky's three generations theory, which would, you know, put us at 25-ish, 30 years maybe. Um, I'm not so sure. Um, I think that there's, there's an element Like I, I, I basically, after I read that article, he made a very, very strong ar argument for the three generations theory. And I love it. And, you know, the, you know, one of the most potent tools for change and, and like critical things for adaptation or what's the, what's the, what's the con, uh, the quote, um, uh, science progresses one death at a time, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, I can't, I can't remember who it is. Uh, uh, but, uh, it's like Newton or some shit, you know, uh, somebody you would know. Uh, but uh, that, you know, you need a generation that lives in a world where Bitcoin, like there are people who were born now who are 15 years old, never knew a world without Bitcoin. It always existed. And once you have those people at 25 and 30, and they're the base of a new growing economy, you know, that, that 20 to 20 to 35 age range is really like, what they are building and what they think about the world is where all of the change is going to occur, or at least the bulk of the change in society is going to occur. And I think we've reached a pace, a, cra a crazy, crazy space when we're talking about the acceleration of technology where we have disruptions on top of disruptions. You know, a hundred years ago, disruptive and systemic technologies, going back to the context of a uh, Or the analogy of the piston engine, you know, most of it's maintaining technologies, uh, whereas disruptive technologies are fair, very, very infrequent. That's not the case anymore. And uh, one of the things that uh, like there's a great book called. Um, uh, I think this is I think it's the cold start problem. Or maybe the secrets of Sand Hill Road. No, 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 no. It's uh, the innovators. Oh, hold on a second. I've got it in my audio books. Um, Uh, there's a great book by a guy from the 90s. He's a he's a professor, um, and he's talking about the differences between Innovator's Dilemma, The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. Um, and he talks about, he, he, he uses that same analogy of the, the maintaining technologies versus the disruptive technologies, and how for a long time we thought of companies as You could, you could build a base in like some sort of a product or service, and then you can operate as like brilliant managers reflecting, you know, with your, or, or working with your customers and, you know, being efficient and not taking huge risks and looking for the big things in the market. And that worked. You could, you could sustain a company like that for 50 years, 70 years, a hundred, you know, a century even. And that's not possible anymore. Sometime in the, the eighties to nineties, There were so many, uh, so many disruptive changes from eight inch discs to five inch discs and from, uh, from, uh, magnetic to spinning discs, like to like, like disruptive changes in the context that the entire function and mode by which we would actually do these things shifted like really quickly, you know, like, you know, the first. 50 years of the idea of recording audio like it was scratch it into a piece of vinyl you know it was, it was it was scratch it into a thing and then we went from cds to digital like like we went in like super compressed time we went over like four different mediums from cassettes cds and digital like 15 years 20 years something like that um 
And, uh, and this is accelerating all across the board. And companies no longer can actually establish, like, like the actually being a good manager as a company will actually kill you now. Because if you're responding to your customers and you're just looking for the maintaining innovations, what you're actually doing is if you're not looking for something that will disrupt your business process, like disrupt your entire model, then you're going to miss it and you're just going to you're just going to die in the next cycle and the next cycle is four years away. Like like it's, it's here every single time. And we're in this weird place where we have disruptions on top of disruptions where we have a disruptive cycle that's occurring with a new technological framework or a new protocol layer. And before it is even like reached any sort of serious maturity in its adoption cycle, there's already the new thing that's going to disrupt it. Like, like we're starting to like, it used to be that you'd, you know, get on this S curve and then it would start to smooth out and then boom, here's this new disruption. And then it would get on an S curve and start to smooth out. And these things were like really gapped together and now they're starting to compress so that like four or five of them are happening at the same time. So the, the comment or the, the, the concept of like uh, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed, is getting way worse because the, all of the futures are here. And we don't even know, like we're, we're all, the, the pace at which humans are learning how to adapt and use things hasn't increased. So if it still takes us 10 years to adopt and understand how a new technology is going to change things and how to integrate it in our lives, but a new disruptive technology is happening every year and a half, well, we're going to be 10, we're going to be 10 behind, you know, as soon as we've adopted the, the, the one that we were trying to figure out. Um, and so we're in this really weird place where everything is just massively accelerating. Uh, what was the, what was the context of the original question? I'm sorry. This was, this was like laying the groundwork for something. <laughs> this, uh, how this uh, Bitcoin world looked like, I think was the complete mm. original question and how this uh, Bitcoin standard will uh, like have a change on society. Yes. So the Bitcoin standard. So the interesting thing is that when you have fiat money, it's like, it's like society moving. Everything is done through molasses. Like you're like knees deep in water. You know how you try to sprint through water? It's like a nightmare, right? It's like it's, it's infuriating and you're like, you look an idiot because your, your legs are flying out to the side because you're trying to get out of the water. Um, this, is, this is essentially what fiat, do, fiat money does to the society because it is a constant dis signal, a, a misinformation mechanism in the attempt to communicate value between each other because there, there is no solid way to communicate value. I mean, it, it, it is money. Like it is an intersubjective thing. It is only by the cost. It is only by the comparison that we actually understand the value of anything. You know, like I'm, I, you know, I can bitch about my iPhone not letting me plug, you know, a USB thing into it or whatever. I can be like, ah, oh, this is this is annoying and it's not valuable. But it only is in the context of like what it's related to is the fact that I there is some other device over here in which I can do that, and so I want that. But if you take my smartphone and all of its capabilities and the internet and you give it to somebody in 1890, it's worth a trillion dollars. It's, it's worth the entire world because it's, it's a scope of existence. It's, I mean, it, it's otherworldly. It's literally a, alien technology. It's like, it's like having a fucking Harry Potter wand. So in the context of like what it costs to achieve and what the alternatives are, it's comparatively the most valuable thing in the world. Well, I sit here and bitch about you know, the fact that I it didn't plug in, I got I to gotta get an adapter, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> so in that context, we have, it's an incredibly difficult thing to um, uh, communicate because it is all relative. You know, it's like speed, you know, if you don't have anything to relate it to, you could be moving a bajillion miles an hour, technically, you know, in outer space and you're just sitting still, like nothing's happening. Um, value is that same way. Um, and because it's intersubjective, we have to have someone, you have to have skin in the game in those decisions. Fiat removes that skin in the game. Fiat removes the ability to have accurate comparisons between you and I, because money is not the same for you as it is for me. And it's not the same for the central banker or the finance guy as it is for the people at the bottom. Like we all have different relationships with money because the money is people, there's just new printing, new debt new this and that happening at every every different stage. It's just constant floods of misinformation in the market. Which means that Bitcoin, a Bitcoin standard will just be like, instead of knee-deep water, solid ground. 
what becomes easier? What things do you do that are so difficult or annoying and knee deep water? When you're on solid ground, you're like, oh, we could do that. We could pull that off. Oh no, that makes perfect sense. Like that's not gonna be that's not gonna be hard. We can run mar marathon. Why not? Why not? I'm not gonna do that shit in knee deep water, but I'll do it now. And so it removes this huge misinformation signal, and it's going to allow the spread. I think it's actually critically necessary because thinking about like the layers of disruption, the speed with which the new technology can disperse and actually be adopted is related to the ability to communicate its value, which means that it might actually, thank God, have the capacity to shorten that span to distributing the future to as many people as possible, as opposed to keeping it in some niche corner and making it difficult to, to, to get out to the public, to, to do the most good. Like this is something that we actually saw during the thirties, like during the great depression. One of the people, a lot of people think that like during like huge economic contract contractions um, and depressionary periods, the innovation stops. That's not true. Innovation stops spreading. We still have tons of new innovations. We still have tons of new like inventions and like fundamental ideas, but they cannot get out from the market. They, there's not the, the, the economic health to distribute it to people. So it basically stays isolated until it's unlocked. And that's why we had this huge boom after World War II ended because World War II and this giant like direct, I'm going to control everything spending program for the government persisted a depression for 12 years um, that just eviscerated the economy and the ability for anything to be healthy. And when they finally let it go, when they finally brought everybody, they, they stopped wasting money on blowing shit up and they brought everybody back into the workforce to build stuff. What do you know? There was a boom. And they're like, oh, the war saved us. And it fucking didn't. It's, the war ended and it saved us, you dummy. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, but it's a great example because if you think about that, like, again, innovation and disruption didn't, the, the progress of technology didn't stop during the 30s. It was just prevented from getting out to people. You can think about our current era very much like that. Because of how bad the fiat system is, we have an enormous amount of disruptive technology. In fact, we have more than we ever have because of the, the natural progression of feedback loops. New technologies will enable the progression of more and better new technologies. Um, like, what is the internet? I mean, you can now disrupt things in a matter of hours. You can now create a new software system as a 13 year old kid in your garage because of the existence of the internet like everything accelerates the next thing um and but we have existed in this place where it's also been made incredibly slow to distribute incredibly difficult to to get out and it still has continued to do so despite it but just because of the this is a force of nature like the the movement of technology i mean you look at the last hundred years and the amount of just, just obliteration of poverty across the world like people don't people don't realize most people bitch and whine about something as it's being solved because when it's basically ubiquitous nobody complains about it like nobody had candlelight vigils about poverty in the 1890s everybody was poor poor was normal you know it's only when you start to realize that this could actually be solved, that everybody complains about it. Everybody says, this is awful. I can't believe we've allowed this to happen. It's like, no, this was the norm. Now you realize that there's a way out and now you're angry at it. Um, and uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. So going back to the concept of a Bitcoin standard, I, I, think, I think we'll witness a renaissance as close to what we could comprehend as a renaissance. Um, we're talking about removing so much friction in the market. We're talking about removing political barriers across the world so that we can interact with other markets. We're talking about AI, which will remove ling uh, linguistic and cultural barriers across the world to add to it. I, I really think it won't be very long before I'll have a Spanish version of Bitcoin Audible read in my voice with my tonality and my emphasis. I don't speak Spanish, you know? Um, and I, I don't think it's... It's like really soon, like really soon that I could have my show in any language that I wanted. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, I can basically do it. It just kind of sucks right now. <laughs> you know, it's like 90% of the way there. Um, I, in fact, I might actually do an investment of just having like somebody who natively speaks Spanish make the corrections. Um, but it's, it's like a combination of tools. But it, it's just like we're just barriers. Barriers are plummeting. And we don't know what the outcomes 
We don't know what a world looks like without those barriers. But I'll tell you, it, it, it looks, I, it, it's at least an order of magnitude, more productive, more uh, faster, and uh, more cleanly communicated than what we have now. Um, and it's, it is going to be, if nothing else, it's going to be a hell of a time to live through. Like, it's, it's just, sometimes I just think, like, of the entire, the entire path of history, like, and the little blip that we are at, at this crazy acceleration curve, and when sound money is actually reinstituted at a scale that it was never possible. Like gold could never produce a society the way a digital, a digital commodity and a, a uh, digital communication protocol that is genuinely global could do. Like, like you're talking about the difference between a digital world and a, and a physical world and what is, what that potential is. Like it's a thousand fold, you know, like it just, they, they, you, you can't compare the two. Um, and like we're here, like right when this is really starting. I think well, people think it's like, oh, look at you know what's happened in like the last thirty years. The internet's like gotten big. No, it literally is just starting. Like like we're in the curve of that whole transition, and it's getting faster and it's accelerating. That's why I think you know ninety nine percent of this Bitcoin supply will be here in twenty thirty four, um, and that last one percent will take a hundred years more more than that to um to distribute i don't i don't see how we make it to the 1930s i mean the 1930s i don't see how we don't make it through the 2030s uh without a bitcoin standard um hmm. with the way things are going now and the fact that feedback loops catch up quick um amazing gradually then suddenly and uh, I say this so many times on the podcast, it's it's like whenever I think of what we are just now living through, I can only think of what a time to be alive, like what 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 privilege and what it's crazy, uh, man. like how grateful can we be to to live right now? And yeah, there's also like so many things in, in, in there that we, we, we should be talking about. And I think um, I, I just thought of, of, of something that uh, that I will, will do now on the podcast and um i because i did till now i never had a guest on two times uh so i want to have guests on also a second round but like mm -hmm. with a year or something like that in in between uh and uh and i i, I never thought about that before but if if I have questions listening to you. I probably listeners also do this podcast have questions about that. So please, if you have a question, the, the guys want, just leave it in the comment. And I, when I have a second round with you, I will take this also as a basis uh, that we can make a second episode. And then we might have some interesting questions and some interesting uh, uh, influence in that. I started sometimes doing it. I think I did it with Jeff Booth when I had him on mm -hmm. like a few weeks ago. I asked the community what questions should I ask? Yeah, Booth is great, man. Uh, he, he's a, he's a, also, also an amazing man to, to listen to uh, and, and to interview. And yeah, then I will I will uh, do that. And we're coming to the end routine where the previous guest is like a little bit like the blockchain. The previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who, who the next guest is. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, then you can also, you will also then ask a question to the next guest without knowing who the next <laughs> guest is. Um, and the question to you from the previous guest is about real estate. Mm, and he talked a little bit on okay. the podcast how uh, the, the, the homeowners now are old and they will... <laughs> die soon uh, and how real estate is such a worse investment uh, against bitcoin when you really compare it but still so many people have the belief system that oh i have to have a home i want to invest in and this is kind of my savings account i take a credit against it and then i can uh, i can like take my home as my main savings account and misuse a home as a savings account 
um and the the fleeing of the the real estate to bitcoin it's like the demonization of 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 real estate and and he was and we kind of touched on it when you talked about bitcoin standard how fast it will go um and he talked about how how fast do you think it will go that we are coming uh, to a collapsing house prices to affordable house prices make housing bitcoin makes i i think so house prices affordable again uh do you think to have a timeline where like okay this will happen in the next five ten years and i think it's was kind of in the last question in there uh but is this comparable yeah 100 percent. um I, i think i think when you look at like kind of a 10 year time frame um as bitcoin really settles in as a trusted asset that's not going anywhere um It will be, especially when we talk about like closing costs okay. and uh, political risk, um, the cost of real estate will start being weighed against the cost of just buying Bitcoin and holding it. Um, because a huge amount of the real estate market is about storing value. It is a huge portion of it is store of value. Like <clears throat> uh, one of the statistics I heard on it is that a third, a third of luxury housing in the Manhattan area sits empty all year. A third. Like that's insane. It did like it gets used for nothing. People are just sitting on it because it's going to go up in value, but it's not. It goes up in nominal price, not value. And uh, the only reason it I, like, I think real estate is actually the better, the best form of, uh, calculating inflation as we have um because it's the predominant store of value i think uh in my opinion for uh getting around the inflation problem and people don't know it like even for like it is the middle class savings account is equity in your home uh like i i bought this house for like this was a small like i was trying to spend as little as i possibly could i even got an fha loan i tried to put as little bitcoin into it as possible because You know, seven years ago, I, I, I saw Bitcoin's future and trajectory. Um, and uh, I bought this house for $157,000. It was 100% fix me up. Like it was, it was, it had some problems. Uh, and uh, there is, I haven't done like a, an appraisal on it for, you know, oh, we ripped out this rotten MDF kitchen and we put in nice custom wood cabinets and quartz countertops. Oh, we completely remodeled two bathrooms. Oh, I dug out the eight foot crawl space. I excavated around it, waterproof the whole thing. And now it's a concrete basement. And I've added, you know, 1100 square foot to square feet to the house. None of that is being calculated. If you just look at the Zillow estimate for what it costs to have this house, according to its ignorant thinking or its ignorant perspective, that it's just the same house as it was when I bought it virtually it's like three hundred and sixty thousand dollars it's not worth like it, it didn't get worth more the dollar got shittier the dollar lost value like there are people and if i sold it i'd pay capital gains i'd pay capital gains on getting around inflation and if i you know sold it for this i can't buy more house i can't like go you know, to the other side of town and buy something way bigger, I buy the same thing. Like, and if you calculate it for, it's like probably like $450,000. If you calculate what I've actually done to it, like in the fact that it's like way, way better condition than when I got it. Um, and like, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's like, that is, that is the destruction of a currency right there. Like if you don't, if you're not framing it right, you just don't understand how awful that is from the context of money that's why bitcoin as a pure price signal is going to completely change the game because my entire relationship to this house is the fact that like i need it for utility i'm not i'm not using it to hedge against the dollar i'm holding the debt to hedge against the dollar so that i don't have to sell my bitcoin but my bitcoin is my pricing mechanism what it will cost me in bitcoin over that time is how i make my decisions so i buy this house Not because I think of it as an investment. I think of it as a loss in Bitcoin, but I need a house. I, I'm, we're starting, we have a family, you know, like I want to have like 16 more kids. 
<laughs> and so like it is a utility cost to me. Like I'm buying it for its utility. It is not an investment anymore. And that mind shift, that, that shift in mental framing will start to occur more and more at a larger and larger degree as the trust network, as the, the trust adoption of Bitcoin grows and real estate will be priced. Real estate won't sit empty. Real estate will not sit empty because that means that your opportunity cost to have Bitcoin is going to just keeping up with inflation and still paying capital gains. So you're doing worse than just just leaving, just exiting the real estate, which means that real estate prices will plummet. But I think it will actually accelerate faster, um, uh, specifically because like the commercial real estate market has imploded since 2020. And it's only because of the BTFP, um, uh, the, the financing program, that it's essentially not come home to roost yet. Uh, and I think when when that kind of like fully implodes and we get our unraveling of the banking crisis there, which has started within uh, the New York Community Bank, um, I think probably like Zion and um, uh, it's like uh, it's M&T, Wells Fargo is actually really exposed to this one. I think it's like 22% of their, their reserves are in commercial real estate. <laughs> um, uh, that's, a, that's a big one. That would be bad. Um, but anyway, it's going to, it's going to be really interesting to watch that unfold. And, uh, I think there could be a second, uh, like, I think we'll have kind of a general real estate collapse and it'll be interesting to see how that plays into it. Because if I was thinking about like just a normal progression from one to the other, Bitcoin would take 10 years, but it could be, you know, two years and then a heavy acceleration in that direction. Um, and, uh, as you know, a serious banking crisis and real estate crisis unfolds, um, in the debt markets and a feedback loop for a negative feedback loop for fiat and for real estate will accelerate, not slow down, you know, like, like it's, it's unlikely to reach some sort of plateau. Let me, let me give you an example. So when Bitcoin starts to become like, like, let's say like a bad policy gets implemented and Bitcoin goes up 20%, like it becomes this extremely loud very in your face indicator of the potential market fallout of policy making uh, policy decisions and like what's going on in the credit markets. Um, as it starts to do that, when it becomes a $5 trillion market, a $9 trillion market, you'll start to see it show up in fiat. It won't just be that Bitcoin goes up. It'll be that fiat dips 1%, 2% immediately like fast and fiat will become increasingly volatile in the negative and Bitcoin will continue to be higher, will continue to be up. And when that happens and it's recognizable, it becomes visible on the fiat side. Well, then it becomes even dumber to not have some exposure to Bitcoin and to like the, the, that, that feedback loop becomes more exaggerated. And then when people say like Bitcoin is volatile, it's like well, fiat is volatile. They made a decision today and it fell 3%. And when you start having that sort of, when it simply is, you can see, when you can see it happening very, very quickly is when, I, I don't think there's any reversing. Like, like I think you've hit the point of no return where it's just going to continue to accelerate because you add another $2 trillion to the Bitcoin market. And now every single move, you know, right now we're in this place where Bitcoin is small enough that it like moves like crazy and dollar is so huge that it's just like really hard to see anything. But as they get closer, the, and you start to see little movements, like I, th I think you just shift, you know, like you, you, you eventually just one's only going down and one's only going up on a long enough timeline. And once you start to see those vol that volatility show up on both sides of the, essentially the, you know, the river, you're pouring water from one to the other. Um, and you start notice that the water is changing over here because this mark, this bucket is now big enough. Um, I think it accelerates really fast. Um, the, cause price signals are everything. And, and right now it's not visible. Right now, you still can't see it because Bitcoin's very small. It, it really is small when you talk about like its actual market cap. 
Um, so I would, I would really love to reassess in three years to see where I think it is. Um, and I think in seven years, it'll be a very, very interesting conversation. Um, in fact, seven years, we may be looking back and thinking like, oh yeah, this is, we're already, we're already past that point where that market can't operate as if Bitcoin doesn't exist. It still can, but I don't think it will for very long. Yeah, definitely. I can 100% subscribe to that. And uh, I think it was an astonishing uh, episode with you. Uh, you're a really, really insightful person. You you, you read and listen. Sorry and for the ramblings. They, no, no, no. They, it's like, they go. It's, 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 it's always mm. crazy good to see if someone actually reads a lot. Like, uh, it's clear that you have so much information. I've read more about Bitcoin than anybody else you know. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and this is, uh, that's why it's uh, such an amazing conversation with you. And I had like, I think I got to one, yeah, one fifth of my, <laughs> my questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh but my I, god I, I always try to over prepare and then let the mm -hmm. conversation fr uh, flow freely uh but uh thank you so much uh for being on thank you so much for for taking the time and being on my show i definitely want oh, yeah, to man. be uh make a, a second run and maybe let next year or something like that and uh yeah uh, where can people ask you directly questions where can people reach out to you where can people find you the best way yeah yeah i am on uh twitter Obviously, uh, that's still a great way to hit me up in DMs, um, though they limit now who can send DMs. And like I, I, I filter through a crap, a ton of crap. Um, so if it takes me a week to get to you, I apologize. Um, if it takes me a month, I, I, that's my bad. <laughs> but uh, still, DMing on Twitter is still a useful thing. Uh, hitting me up on Telegram is actually probably a higher hit rate. Um, Noster is a good one too. I'm at the guy Swan on all of it. Just the guy Swan, Swan with two N's. Um, and of course you can check out Bitcoin Audible, uh, AI Unchained. Uh, and I've got another project actually that's been in the works for a little bit, um, that'll come out soon on the show side. And then I've also got a development project that we've been working on. So lots, lots of stuff to come. Uh, I'd love to check those out. And I've been trying to do a lot of little like explainer, like I've been referring to them as guys, two sats. Uh, uh, my two sats videos where I'm trying to distill because I have the, t I'm going to tell you something you don't know, but I have a tendency to ramble for an hour on a topic when <laughs> asked a question and I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to do my best to distill this shit down into like three minutes. Um, and it's very, very hard. It takes a week to, to really like bring it down, you know, edit it to what the heart of the argument is. Um, but I'm trying to do that in videos and they've done really, really well. They've gotten a lot of attention. So um, I think that's a really good one. Uh, and then, of course, Keat. Um, I know a lot of people don't know about Keat, uh, but honest to God, when I think about like the most important things that are happening right now and the, the kind of critical technological changes, when I think about the layers of disruption that I mentioned, um, I think Bitcoin, AI, Noster, and Keat. Well, not Keat. Whole Punch is the protocol. Keat is just kind of an application built on top of it. But it's the proof of concept that, holy shit, this works. Um, check it out if you haven't. Um, I think it is the most unsung of the most important things that are happening right now. And I spend my whole day on it. Um, so uh, definitely check that out too. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for, for, taking the, for, for taking the time. Oh, wait. Do Am I asking a question for the next guy? Uh, yes, I usually do it offline, but you can also do it uh, while we oh, record. Okay, got you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make it very simple. I'll make it very simple. Is what's the most important thing? Perfect. What's the most important thing? That's it. Love it. Uh, it's it's fascinating for me because I have now you're my seventy seventh guest on, and I did not had any question two times. So uh, let's <laughs> see how how long this piece continues. Perfect. Then uh, thank you for taking your time and uh, we'll see you soon. Hell yeah, man. Appreciate it, dude.